Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Libertopia. It is the premier libertarian venue, and I call it premier because they allow me to be the opening speaker. That's my price. And, uh, of course, I'm Stefan Molyneux, host of Free Domain Radio, but I will be your MC and um, general all-around bad joke maker uh, of the day. And uh, look, can you believe the stage? I came in here last night. We actually originally had a room up there, but we thought it might be too loud for my daughter. Looked at the stage, and it was like, Billy Idol played here three days ago. Can you believe it? It's, it's still sticky. Sticky with post-80s failure. <laughs> oh, come on. And I was trying to think, what, what good libertarian words could I put for, to a Billy Idol song? All I could come up with, uh, it's a nice day for some state shedding. Anyone? No? Yeah, that's the best I could do. This is why Billy Idol gets a musician and I don't. So a couple of uh, announcements, I guess, just before we get started. Uh, please remember there is a food truck full of most excellent food just up the ramp there. Um, we invite you to get to know each other. Right? This is a great place for networking and finding friends and people you can activize with. So get your food. We've got tables uh, up there around the side here. Of course, please talk to the vendors uh, who are partly responsible for the event as a whole. So I hope that you will check them out. I'd also like to put a uh, special shout out to Mark Victor, who is uh, a premier sponsor of Libertopia. Of course, he's one of the uh, best attorneys for freedom that you will ever come across. And I know, just looking in the audience, that there are some of you who need him. I'm thinking of you, that whole row, and this whole side. In fact, this whole side, don't just take his car, just take him home. Uh, you'll need him on a permanent basis, I think. And uh, also, um, we have Liberty Coin and Precious Metals uh, sponsoring the Sovereign Awards which is uh, the lunchtime event today. Uh, three great liberty activists are getting lifetime awards. And uh, we still have some tickets left for that if you would like to pick up some tickets. Uh, it should be a really, really enjoyable event. Uh, and you can just go behind the stage here and to the groupie pit and uh, you can pick up some tickets there. I hope that you will, you will do that. So uh, we're just gonna ramble a little bit more. I just wanted to mention that if you have a desire to come up and speak. This is a great audience. And remember, all of this is being recorded, which means that you will be prestigiously displayed on YouTube until the end of time. And we have an open mic tomorrow. And if you're interested in doing that, we're going to just, I'll mention it, of course, beforehand. But if you have a cause, if you have a website, if you have something you want to talk about uh, to, to everyone here and everyone out on, in internet land, just you know, line up. We'll do all of that. We have great bands. Today, uh, I think I'm going to finally fulfill a childhood dream of mine and scream, are you ready to rock at an audience and then unfortunately not sing, well, fortunately for you, not sing and exit the stage. So we've got all of that going on. Uh, we're going to try and keep things on time. Again, we like to be totalitarian with our timepieces. Uh, we have a comedian at one o'clock. I hope that you will come out and join uh, him and see what really funny jokes look like. And of course, there's a dinner tonight, so you can all check your schedules for that, and um, we hope that you will join us with all of that. And we did have one cancellation today, so we're going to mull over whether we're going to fill that out. I sort of suggested what I really like to do is a sort of philosophy Q&A with an audience, uh, with the audience, if you're interested in that. So we'll remind you about that at the end of the day. We might fill that in at the end of the day and see if anyone's interested in that. So I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Oh, yeah, Carla. Where's Carla? Is she here? Oh, hi, Carla. Listen, uh, I just wanted to mention, you, you've seen the stage here, right? Okay, you, you've taken some photographs of the stage. I suggest that for Porkfest next year. Uh, Carla runs Porkfest, uh, which is also a great libertarian venue, uh, anarchist venue to talk about great ideas with. But it's a little different in terms of the layout. When you go to Porkfest as a speaker, they'll show you where you're speaking and you'll say, but Carla, that's a barn. <laughs> Old MacDonald signed up for Free State, e -I -E -I But it's a great venue too. So yeah, just wanted, this is, this is of course now, this is what I expect. Uh, for every time that I speak, this is what I'm gonna be looking for. Uh, and uh, Billy Idol will have to play there three days before, just so you know. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, a, a brief little case. I'm gonna make a case for a particular argument or intellectual approach. And uh, of course I hear the lawyers in the audience of which there are more than a few say case, ooh, now I can object. Please don't object, please, because <laughs> you're much better at it than I am. So I don't like to stand here the whole time because I like to make it challenging for the camera people. He's going this way, no, he's going this way. So I would like to make a case for not being patient. 
in your activism. Look, I've just had, do we have a lot of activists out there, like people who are doing stuff, uh, uh, chaining themselves to politicians so that you can sneeze every time they lie, whatever it is that you're doing? Okay, good. So for those of you, and look, the reality is we're all activists of one kind or another, whether you're filming uh, uh, one of the cats in blue or you're simply talking about freedom with people in your life, everybody here is an activist of one kind or another because once you have the truth, it's something that you inevitably need to inflict on everyone else. And I, I mean, I grew up in, in England, and I, but I think it's a similar thing here where if you're an activist, a lot of what you get back when you talk about freedom and nonviolent solutions to social problems, a lot of what you get back is be patient. Don't go too fast. For everything, there is a season. Good things come to those who wait. Don't be too pushy. Don't alarm people. You have to wait for history to kind of get behind you like a, like a current pushing salmon up a stream or down a stream. And I heard a lot of that, and I believed it, I think, for quite some time, that I didn't want to get too pushy, and I wanted to wait for sort of some historical wave to, to sort of catch me and, and move me forward and accelerate me, like I, maybe it could be in a yacht and just wait for social change to fill the sails, and all I'd have to do is steer. And after waiting for that <laughs> for quite some time, I realized that it was a trap. It was a trap. It was not something that was designed to actually get me out there changing the world or working to change the world, but it was a, a council of patience that was a really, really bad idea. And there are a lot of thinkers out there, um, Hegel, Marx, uh, other thinkers, who believe that sort of historical determinism, that there are these big movements of class conflict or the world spirit or whatever, that that's what changes things and we're all kind of carried along in this big tide of change and we can maybe paddle a little bit this way or that way, but we are not the tide, all we can do is navigate the tide or the wave. And that diminishes willpower. Willpower. And we'll come back to that right at the end, but that diminishes our willpower. And what it does is it gives us this idea that if we wait, then some sort of momentum will make our job so much easier. And I'm here to argue strongly against that. Because I always sort of ask myself, if you want to change the world, the first place I go to is I say to myself, okay, if I want to change the world, what do the rulers do? What do the people in charge do? Do they wait for social momentum to get behind them? Did the creatures from Jekyll Island wait for the historical dialectic to get behind them to create a central bank? No. They slithered off to an island, they conspired, they made it happen. They willed it, and from that will came their power. When politicians want to get something done, do they just wait for the will of the people to manifest itself? Move them forward to their objective? No. Pass a law. They get all the guns in the world, pointed at all the people in the world, and say, do it or we'll cage you. That is not waiting for history to get behind you. That is making things happen. The people in charge make things happen. They will it, and they will it against the will of the people. Because almost all laws are the exact opposite of what people want. Because if people wanted it, you wouldn't need a law. You don't need a law that says, sex is good and I like chocolate. And this counseling of wait for the right time, wait for the sweet spot, wait for the planets to align, to give you the chance to make change in the world. We'd never teach that to our kids. I mean, this is another thing that I look at when I think about change, is what, what do we teach to our children? I think it's important. So if your son doesn't do his homework, I mean, can you imagine saying to your son, okay, so here's what you do. You go, go to the teacher and say, uh, listen, um, sorry, teach the historical zeitgeist didn't really get behind me finishing my math homework, so I wasn't able to, to complete it. Would the teacher say, hey, you know, historical zeitgeist, I got it, that makes sense. No, it'd be like, hey, you didn't choose to do your homework, too bad for you. Mom, I'll clean my room as soon as the dialectical materialism gives me the momentum to complete that task. Nobody would believe that at all. Or at work. Oh, man, I wish I could have finished that report, my boss, but 
the will of the people just wasn't there for me. <laughs> I couldn't make it work. No, I wouldn't, I would, nobody would believe that. Or with a cop. Ah, you see, the world spirit was getting behind me, making me speed, officer. I'm sorry about that, but you know, what can I do? I'm a helpless pawn of historical forces. Nobody would believe that. And so if that's what we teach our children and that's how we live our life, I think it's reasonable to say that that's how we should focus the energies of our activism. Because there's always been, there have always been these two ethics in the world. The ethics for the rulers, which is around willpower, domination, control, getting things done, forcing people to do things, making things happen, making history, making the world, making the future, shaping it through the force of aggressive will. I believe in the will. I don't believe in the aggression. But that's the way the rulers do it. That's the eye for an eye. On the other hand, there is the ethic for the ruled, for the serfs, for the slaves, for the taxed. And that ethic is, bide your time, be patient, don't rush. Social change takes time. Wait for the right momentum. Wait, wait for something mysterious to coalesce behind you and push you forward. Never going to happen. And it makes perfect sense that the rulers would invent that ethic because when you take power in society, you set up a dangerous precedent as a ruler, which is other people can take power <laughs> in society, right? If you become the ruler as like an aristocrat, it's just a, an excellent murderer. You have to set up this ethic for those who come after you. I took power by force. I took power by violence. I took power by will. Well, every ruler gets old. <laughs> and weak, and roomy, and blind. And so they have to set up this ethic that says, well, I took power by force, but now you must wait for the right moment. And that right moment will never come. So it makes sense to me that the rulers would set up an ethic which says to everyone they rule over, you should not will change in the world. You must wait. And it used to be that they would call this the will of God, right? That they would say that the, the king is divinely appointed by God, by the deity. And you cannot disobey the king because that's the same as disobeying the deity. That's what differentiates him from you. But then, of course, the Enlightenment happened and the scientific revolution happened and a lot of people said, I'm not so down with the deity anymore. They said, that's okay, we got a backup clan called the will of the people. I represent the will of the people and therefore you can't go against me. Or if you want to change society, all you have to do is convince the majority of people to agree with you. So I bribe them with all the money in the world, and all you have to do is sway them with your words, <laughs> and everything will change. They know that that's impossible. So they're comfortable with that, because it gives you the illusion that you can change things, but it sets up a situation where changing things becomes impossible. And I view it sort of like this. It's sort of a dialogue that, that you have with society. It may be spoken, it may be unspoken, but it's a dialogue where you say, I think that we should do things peacefully. I think we should do things voluntarily. I think we should put down these guns and start reasoning with each other rather than forcing each other, rather than passing laws, rather than printing currency, rather than bribing the brain dead with the money of the unborn. I think we should reason with each other. And they say, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I know what you can do. There's this train station over the hill down the valley. It's kind of dusty kind of cobwebby, a couple of hippies down there, maybe a few neocons. And you go down to that, that station. And don't worry if the tracks are rusty and don't worry if there are bird's nests on the ties between the tracks. Don't worry about all of that. Because don't worry, there's this train coming that's going to make your job so much easier. And that train is called coalescing social consensus or something like that. It's the movement of history. It's the tide of change. That's going to get behind you. And that train's going to come along any day now. And all you have to do is get on that train and you can just go and the momentum will be with you and the people will be with you and everywhere you go everyone's going to cheer and everything that was opposed before will be accepted now and everything that was resisted before will be supported now and it will be like going down a greased ice chute. You won't have to climb up painfully. It's going to be like luging. <laughs> Wait, you, you guys from California, what the hell does luging mean to you? <laughs> Imagine being a penguin in a tube of ice. <laughs> That's looting. 
But that train never comes. That train will never, ever, ever come. That's why they're happy with you going down to that station. Or going to, let's use a metaphor from the outdoor venue, going to go sit in a yacht. I'm going to sit in a yacht and have my hand on the tiller. I'm going to be ready to go. Hand on the tiller. That wind's coming. Oh, I can feel it. It's coming. It's not here yet. It's going to be here soon. It's coming. Wind never comes. You just sit there. Because you want, all you want to do is steer with some momentum behind you, but that momentum will never come. The momentum never comes. The momentum has to be made. It has to be willed. There are no shortcuts. There is no easy path. There is not ever going to be a momentum that makes the ideas of peace and voluntarism and statelessness and freedom palatable to people. Everybody will tell you, wait for the right time. And the only reason they will tell you to wait for the right time is that they know for an absolute certainty that that right time will never come. And you will grow old and dusty and roomy <laughs> and you will have cataracts waiting for the train, waiting for the wind, waiting for the right time to come which is never coming. So, I focus on something a little different. And what I focus on is the recognition that history, philosophy, ideas, society, the future itself, is nothing more or less than the will of the individual the will of the individual. And what looks like social change, what looks like a general movement, is simply the wake left behind by the will of the individual. It only looks like a movement because people are so ferocious in their willpower that they create that change. And the change is so broad and so deep only because the convictions of the individual is so broad and so deep that it is irresistible. And the one thing that we do have in terms of momentum, I argue, is that history and the mind and society and humanity as a whole, we, we tend or trend towards consistency. When you write down, all men are created equal, sooner or later, you have to get rid of slavery because that is the more consistent position. Throw women and children in there and we're in Shangri-La. And the world trends towards consistency. And there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that we have by far the most consistent message in the history of the world. We have by far the most consistent message in the history of the world. What do we say? We say that the non-initiation of force is morally good. The initiation of force is evil. The respect for property rights is morally good. Violation of property rights, immoral. I mean, that's what we tell kids in kindergarten. <laughs> so we have the most consistent moral message out there. And I think, or I would argue, that the ingredient that we sometimes forget, and I put myself in this category too, I'm not preaching from any higher place of <laughs> perfect knowledge, is that the only thing that is missing is the willpower to continue to drive the message home and to not be patient and to be pushy, to be uncomfortable for other people. Because nobody like, I, I was raised in England, I don't like making people uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not, you know, you'd like to discuss your hydrangeas over tea rather than talk about the violence inherent in the system. <laughs> But nonetheless, it is absolutely necessary that we grit our teeth, set our willpower to the sticking place, and be willing to make people uncomfortable, to push those conversations, to say to people, if you support the state, you support the use of violence against me as an individual. If you want to pay taxes, that's fine. You can mail a check. If you force me to pay taxes, then you're saying, I cannot disagree with you without being thrown in a cage for years. That is not a civilized position. 
you are not a civilized human being if you advocate the initiation of force against other human beings. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, but don't shoot the messenger. The guy who tells you that you are ill is not the guy who makes you ill. He is the guy who makes you better. The person who tells you that you support violence if you support the state is not the person who makes you bad. That is the person who can make you good by identifying the corruption that you support. And there is an enormous amount of discomfort in the moral conversation of mankind. Because owning the moral conversation is owning the world. Owning the moral conversation is owning the violence or the lack of violence in society. Owning that moral conversation is fundamentally, I would argue, owning the future. Willpower, I believe, is driving that stake into the heart of the world itself so deep, so deep, and standing by it so firmly, though you're hands shake and you sweat and your teeth feel like they're rotating at times, standing by that stake of truth so deeply that the world has no alternative but to begin to orbit around that truth. That nonviolence is the only way forward in the world. That peace and statelessness and voluntarism and property is the only way to build a civilized future. This we all accept in our private lives. We simply have to break down that barrier that separates private virtue from public vice. Being upstaged by some ducks. <laughs> the ducks clearly are statists. <laughs> if we can break down the morality, sorry, if we can break down the barrier between private morality and what is called public morality, right? So for you and I to initiate the use of force to steal something because we happen to be poorer than our neighbor is wrong, is immoral, we go to jail for that. For the government to do it is democratic egalitarianism. It's caring for the poor, it's being good, it's being right, it's being lovely. If we crank out a printing press of dollar bills in our basement, oh my goodness, we are evil counterfeiters. We must go to jail. Ah, you see, but for the government it's sound fiscal policy. If I go kill a man who is not threatening me as a private citizen, that is evil. It's about the greatest evil. And I would go to jail for decades or perhaps even go to my grave at the hands of the state. Ah, you see, but put a green costume on me, ship me overseas, suddenly I get a medal and a pension. Because there is this opposite world you step into this opposite world, it's through the looking glass. The private virtues and vices get completely reversed when you go to the public sphere. Now, the initiation of force is not only permissible, it is moral. And to not initiate force is immoral. To not point guns at the heads of parents, to force them to send their kids to be indoctrinated, sorry, educated, that's wrong. Because then, my goodness, who's going to educate the children? Because Lord knows they're being well-educated now. And so, to break down this barrier between what we all fully accept as moral and immoral in our private lives, and which we are told incessantly and repeatedly and rightly is immoral and moral in our private lives, to simply extend that to everybody, to be all-inclusive, to be consistent, that there is no magical aura called being a politician that exempts you or reverses the fundamental common law morality of mankind. That is a consistent position. And consistency will win if we will it. If we will it strongly enough. If we are willing to push people to that extremely uncomfortable place called, while you think you are good, you may be supporting immorality. You may be supporting evil. You may be feeding the beast that feeds on mankind. So my suggestion, let me just check my time here before I, normally I uh, ask people who are organizing this to have somebody with some sort of tranquilizing blow dart <laughs> on either side, and, and more than one, because I can keep going through three or four of those. I mean, I slur a little, I slow down, I wind down, wait, I still have four more tangents to go. <laughs>
But I want to make sure that we're staying on time, so I'll cut this a little short, and I will say this, though. People will tempt you with the dusty, old, cobwebby train station called Patience and waiting for the right moment. Any Yes Minister fans in there? Anyone ever seen that show? You remember that, that really oily uh, Mandarin who says, Minister, in the fullness of time. <laughs> he always says that. Patience, in the fullness of time. When the time is ripe, we will strike. Time is never ripe. There is no striking. But people will try to lure you down to that dusty old train station or get you to sit in that cobwebby yacht and wait for some motive power to come along and sweep you up and move you in some direction that will create some magical, powerful momentum of change in society. Fairies will lift you into the future and you will fly and scream your truth from the rooftops and everybody will go, wow, fairies, he's got to be right. The fairies ain't coming. That was going to be the name of my speech. The fairies aren't coming. But I thought that might be offensive to some. You know that fairy lobby? Anyway, get all these complaints. I mean, it's on really nice stationery, you know? But... So my suggestion is do not wait for some external tide or train or wind or momentum or any external power. We don't wait for the tide. We have to be the tide. There's no point waiting for the train. You have to be the train. You can't wait for the wind. You have to be the wind, which means be pushy. It means be annoying. It means be that Socratic gadfly that people are fascinated and repelled by. <laughs> Hopefully, there's more fascination than repulsion in the audience now. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, we'll go with that. But if we understand that there is no mode of power in history or the present or the future or in society, but the individual will, but the choice to be relentlessly and irritatingly consistent with a moral message that is philosophically valid, if we understand and accept that, then we will never be tempted to waste our lives waiting for a momentum that is never coming, but we will instead go out and be the momentum that changes the world and not be suckered into wasting our lives in the inconsequentiality of waiting for some external engine to move us forward. And it is so tempting to do that because it seems like it's going to be so much easier to steer rather than swim. But it is a way to waste your existence. And we have such a responsibility as people who know the truth. We have such a responsibility, whether we like it or not. If you are a doctor in a time of plague, you kind of have to help. You kind of have to. I mean, imagine there's some guy choking to death on a piece of halibut in a restaurant, and you're a doctor who knows the Heimlich, and you're like, no, 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 I can't help. I'm waiting for my profiterole. I mean, that would just be a jerk. You'd have to help. And to help means to be grating, to be annoying, to be insistent, as positively as possible, as enjoyably as possible, but as relentlessly as possible, because it's that relentlessness that is the only thing that will make change. We have to walk through a wall of social indifference and hostility and fear of change. People fear change in the ethics of society, because, yeah, sometimes it leads to the American Revolution, sometimes it leads to the French Revolution, and 600,000 people decapitated by guillotine. So people are kind of leery, and they're right to be so. But nonetheless, we have validated and we know the truth that we're speaking. And so, to sum up, I've been talking a lot about willpower. Will power. Will power. I would submit to you that they are the same word. And we will not achieve power any other way than through our will. Thank you.